Welcome to a special edition of the Space Bar Radio Show with me, Jessica Lee Morgan, and Christian Thomas. This is what we look like. This is what we look like. This is us. Obviously, if you're listening on the radio, you can't hear. You can't hear what we look like. No, <laughs> you can't see what we look like. Here we are in the practice rooms in Reading, where I teach the Alexander Technique on a Thursday, as well as in London on a Friday. Well, obviously not here, but in London. Uh, today, I just wanted to talk to Chris as my foil and who's someone who knows me about the different applications of the Alexander Technique and some of the um, obstacles I have in trying to encourage different kinds of people to come and see what it's like. So we've been talking recently about things like trauma. Um, do you, have you ever had any trauma, Chris? I've had physical trauma. Physical trauma. What, um, what was that? Broken ankle. Right. So that's um, what they call trauma in a clinical setting. Yeah. I've, yes, sorry, I've had clinical trauma mm. then, yes. Yeah. I, no. So trauma. I mean, having spoken to a few people and knowing a few people with uh, a psychological trauma in their, in their lives and their minds... There is some question about whether they're ready to come and have Alexander Technique lessons because they think that, um, oh, well, I must feel better before I come and see. But we talked about, you know, how we, do you remember when you were a kid, if you if you fell over? That happened quite a lot. Did, did it? Oh, yeah. What was the first thing you did when you fell over? Uh, probably scream in agony, I would imagine, because yeah. I, I used to do things properly. Yeah. I'd end up with a, a you know, bike spokes sticking out of my ears or something, Ooh. or, you know, s- taking all the skin off my oh. chest or something. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. It's, but that, that's what you do as a kid, isn't it? You well, know, I you... did. I fell off my bike, got a nice hole in my elbow. My mate was riding his grifter and he had a stick down his trousers oh, and no, he fell off his, no, off no, his grifter and he, no, he, he, he no. put a stick through something that you shouldn't put sticks no. through. I don't know if we want all these gory details. <laughs> what I wanted to get at was how how much it hurts mm. physically. And then you've got the psychological embarrassment of having fallen over, you know, yeah. for in public or something. It's a shock, isn't it? It is. It's a real physical shock. And so I think the kids, kids' first reaction to kind of cry and scream it all out until they've screamed it all out is a really good reaction because eventually they stop crying and they come to quiet and they've been mended and you know everybody's calmed down and and there's nothing left to to do except just mend then isn't there but can you imagine if a if a shock comes in a in a a verbal or or other kind of physical form i mean that's the thing isn't it and you, you said about have I had trauma? I mean, I guess we've we've all had trauma because mm. we've all got stories whereby someone has said something to us or we've been in a situation that we couldn't get out of, that mm. we didn't enjoy. And um, you, know, you, you hold on to that and it becomes part of your lived experience, doesn't it? So yes. in that sense, yes, we all have. Yeah. But yeah. obviously that that's not to make, uh, you know, not to delimit other people's or, or to, what's the word that I'm trying to say there? Um... It's not to make light or to make anybody else's trauma yes. feel small by yes. saying that. I'm not. I'm not saying yeah. that. But it's just that it's it is what it is. It, how you get affected by something, and it could be something. It could be the last straw. Mm. It could be something so minor that that's the thing that pushes you over the edge. Yes. Because you may have had other traumatic things going on. So what I was thinking about is, say, somebody who's had a say a particular traumatic experience that you can point out. Now, I looked at post-traumatic, stress, st- post-traumatic stress disorder the other day uh, just to try and find out what, uh, if anything, the Alexander Technique could do for people in that situation. Because when you look at it, someone might be suffering from it. It might be a delayed reaction. Um, they might not even know. And what it said was that, so you have this initial trauma, so a horrible thing happens. And as a grown-up, we are less inclined to start screaming <laughs> or running around in circles or, you know, flapping our hands or something. Societal norms. And Societal norms mustn't, especially us Brits, we mustn't do that. So the trauma happens 
and you think mustn't express at all. Yet the body um, starts the cycle of reacting. So the nervous system, for instance, then takes over. And what you get is this trans transfer between the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the one that regulates all our normal stuff, heartbeat, breathing, digestion, saliva production, things like that. And then it goes into the sympathetic nervous system, which is the one that suppresses all those things. It suppresses your saliva, your digestion, uh, everything like that. And then starts promoting, uh, producing these um, stress hormones, so adrenaline, cortisol, in order that you can then react to whatever has just accosted you or chased you or ambushed you, saber-toothed tiger. The saber-toothed tiger, yeah. So that you can run away or that you can react or, you know, that's why we have um, cases of superhuman strength, you know, people have lifted cars off people because of the, the trauma. It suppresses all their pain receptors so that they can do something incredible to get out of that situation. And then the idea is that the, the, the cycle will eventually discharge and then the parasympathetic nervous system will, will, will kick back in and all the usual stuff will carry on. But if people haven't been able to get rid of that trauma cycle, then they're living in a state of permanent uh, sympathetic nervous system where their digestion is still suppressed, uh, their hair growth is suppressed, their saliva is suppressed. What's happened to me? Well, all these things. So this is why stress makes Sorry. your hair fall out. It gives you things like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and My hair hasn't fallen out. I do have IBS. <laughs> but, yeah. So you have IBS. Yeah. So, so your body does these weird things because it thinks that you're going to be attacked at any moment. And if you've never managed to process that stress cycle, um, then you're living that permanent state of fear. Uh, there's a reflex that it, it scrunches you in um, and everything just stops working properly because you're always waiting for the next blow. And um, I remember saying to my Alexander Technique teacher that I wasn't just reacting to the latest thing that had just happened that, to irritate me. I was reacting to that whole category of that kind of thing happening to me, you know, all at once. So I scooped like from my past mm. all, all these crappy situations. And boy, were they so. <laughs> and brought them to bear on the current situation which really wasn't that bad but it was like yeah, all of these things were happening at the same time that this happened yes as robin hitchcock would say yes <laughs> all these things were concurrent it's not the issue that i've got right now but it was happening <laughs> it was happening around the same time yeah. that's it um so um so that's what stress and trauma and ptsd and all these things mean to me and what what where I would like to help as an Alexander Technique teacher is that if you if you come, let's for instance this beautiful place the practice rooms, is is run by a psychotherapist and the other people here um, there are some psychotherapists and counsellors and that kind of thing so they can look at those things where you can talk you're encouraged to talk through the thing that happened or the things that worry you, in an Alexander Technique least you still can't say it you know. Alexander Leeson, you say that quite a lot here. Is that someone you used to know when you were a kid? A Leeson. Alexander Leeson. <laughs> Alexander Leeson, who's he? Uh, in an Alexander Technique lesson, you don't have to talk about any of that stuff. Um, you can, but I'm not a counsellor. I'm not a trained counsellor or a psychotherapist. So I'm, I'm happy to listen, but it's not what I'm there to deal with. What I am there to deal with, or to help you deal with, is your physical response to those thoughts and things that are welling up inside you. So again, I remember another situation, there was I reacting to the latest in a chain of crappy situations. And um, I asked the teacher at the time, do you think that if I just worked on my use, which is what we call, you know, the way you use your yourself, which is all of you, your mind and your body, if I just worked on that, then the, the, the crappy thoughts that were going around in my head would eventually dissipate. And he said, well, I don't know, let's see. So we worked together in the way that you normally would in any Alexander lesson. And um, funnily enough, I felt better. The thoughts did kind of subside. Um, and I did feel freer and I did feel less crumpled up the front and less rigid and all those kinds of things. So, 
So I'm thinking of certain people in particular who feel that they're not ready to come to an AT lesson because they've got all this other stuff to deal with first and then they'll get around to the AT lesson. But if, if, they, if they're going around in circles trying to work out all the other stuff and nothing's worked, then they might as well try. And hey kids, I am offering a free 30 minute online session just to see if it might help. So you might as well try it, wouldn't you say? No, yeah. I wish I'd known about it when I was going through my spiraling anxiety. Right. Um, that would have been very useful. Um, one thing that I, I wonder about, uh, we, we've spoken about it, it's okay when you're in a lesson to listen to the direction and you're, so say you're lying down. Right. But when you've got spiraling anxiety, that just having a lie down and trying to give yourself that direction might be quite difficult to drown out everything else that's going on in your head at the time. Yes. That was something that you struggled with, wasn't it? It was, yes. So if you uh, if you come for a lesson, we work in the chair, noticing all the things that are happening to you and seeing if we can stop them. Then we'll work in the table, um, just a kind of a guided relaxation, um, constructive rest, we call it. Then I'll encourage you to do it at home. And again, you and I went through this. You and I saw the same teacher in Cardiff mm -hmm. to start with many years ago. And... Hello, Tim. Hi, Tim. Tim Keldson. Um, and we were encouraged to go home and lie down with our head on the books. You can see this in another video that I've made. Um, and just basically let go of things. But to me at the time, with my head in kind of a million pieces, it was really hard, isn't it? Because silence is really scary when you're... Yes. It can be, Seeing yes, that spiralling yeah. anxiety, constant bordering on panic attack mm. that you feel is really quite horrible. And you think that if you if you let go, then you'll kind of shatter or yeah. that that's the only thing holding you together. So so did you, did you find anything to overcome that? So obviously you tried to get out of that cycle. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I got there in the end, but fortunately it wasn't the Alexander technique, but mm. um, I, I got there in the end by using the, um, the, that kind of... The, the, it's a similar kind of thing to what you're saying there, that thing where you just trip your senses up. Yes. You know, um, five things that you can taste, four things that you can hear, three things, you know. Yes. Um, I used to always go, our, our dear mate Jimbo yes. told me about his one, which was to remember the mundane things, what colour socks yes. you're wearing, what colour pants you're wearing. Not very good for me because back then, always I, mean, good. I, I, I always wear <laughs> always black. Always black, I've got um, blue socks. I, I, I've actually, everything is black today. But... <laughs> But that is the point you've still got to think about. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, that uh, one pair but that, of blue that was, pants. Uh, and it was one of those things that, you know, you, you do that and you trip up. Mm. You just short circuit that um, spiral. Yes. And it, it just takes you out of it. Because the fact is you probably won't die. You think at the time, I'm going to die. I was pretty sure. Well, I mean, yeah. you, know, you know how it is. Uh, several times I've just said, well, go on then, kill me. Because it, it can't get any worse than this, so go on then. Exactly, and it's at that point, um, you know, you and I are both no strangers to this depression, anxiety spiral, and at that point when you go, just sod it, go on then. Yeah. Just do it, just and do it your worst. Because here we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's the point where you can, and that we and we use that in lessons as well. It's not that people come to to AT teachers in a state of spiralling anxiety. All this has been you known. Were, yeah. I I often turned up at Tim's house going, "I'm completely broken. Please fix me." Um, and he, you know, of course, he wasn't a psychotherapist, but he would just say, "Do you just want to get on the table yeah. and and come to quiet?" And um, I think once you've hit rock bottom, you're not scared anymore because right. you just go, "Sod it." So you've got um, one of the things that you've done, which is very useful. And again, I would have loved to have had this back then, is you've done the guided lie down, mm. which I think that, that kind of helps to block out some of that. So all of this is that that would be my block to not doing um, Alexander back then. Right. I would have been so scared of that and also that getting to the point of fear of one, telling somebody that I had this issue and then two, you know, and being told that I was mad or people didn't believe me that yeah. would be the other one because I, I, I did have that people didn't believe me um, yeah. but then there was that thought of just I would have worried about hang on I can't do this on my own I can't just I can't just lie on the floor yes I can't do that you know so having someone talking to me um, who I'd learnt or I'd been with yeah. and then 
guiding me through it would would have been a very useful thing, I think. Right, right. And it, it is, you know, obviously there's that whole meditation thing. Alexander Technique is meditation, isn't it? Um, you're listening, or you, you, so if you've got those words, you know, just telling you, just bringing you back to, never mind what else is going on, just try and expand. Just give a yes. bit of thought to expanding. You know, yes. Think about your pelvis, expand your pelvis. You, you can't make it expand, but you can think about it. Yes. And it just gives you that direction. Yes. And it's, that, it's, that's enough. Well, that, that was often enough. Just to bring you back, yes. Yeah. There weren't any uh, recorded ones back when we were taking lessons. I used to have Radio 4 Extra on. <laughs> Well, that, that didn't stress you out. Um, no, there was usually something stupid on or, or something I could just tune out. Music was too triggering for me because, you know, we're musicians, I can't relax to music. No. Do you remember we, used to, we saw a chiropractor of sorts in Cardiff and she had kind of new agey music on. It was just so distracting. Awful. Awful. Um, Somebody got paid for that as well. Oh, we're missing a trick. Yeah. But the other thing, of course, uh, I used to hear a funny story from my teacher, Ron, my training teacher, uh, one of the great teachers said, how are you getting on with that lying down thing I told you to do? And he says, well, it's all right, but I kind of get a real pain in my chest across here. And he says, well, what are you doing? And he says, well, I've got the times like this, you see. <laughs> Back in the day was a broadsheet. For the benefit of the listeners who, who aren't watching this on YouTube, I'm holding my Jessica hands has her arms spread apart. So you imagine if you're trying to hold up a newspaper with your arms stretched out, you know, lying on your back, it's going to... You wouldn't do it in bed, would you? Well, well, you might do. And I've caught other people looking at their phones, which, of course, you twist your head if you look at your, look at your phone and you're, and you're on your back. So that's not good. And, of course, your attention has been drawn to all kinds of rubbish that you're looking at. It's a real thing, isn't it? Because you, you have to give yourself that whatever it is, 25 minutes, 15, 25 minutes, half an hour. Even just whatever 10, it is, yes, just to start. Whatever it is, you've got to give yourself that time Yes. to lie down. Yes. And... In the middle of your busy day, you have to justify it to yourself, and you're thinking, "Oh, perhaps I could just check an email or something." Yeah. And it is that thing. No, don't do anything. Stop. And or you know, if you're going to use your iPhone, have yes. it to be. Or other phones are available. Yeah. Have it playing a guided lie down. Yes. Yes. You know, to make more versions of they? I know that we we had this whole thing talking about the apps that teach you to do meditation the other yes. week. But this is one of those circumstances. As I said in the show, then you have something on your phone that says in your calendar it's not an app telling you yeah. Jessica is not going to be making an app for this there, there is but actually an app but I haven't tested right. it out oh, yeah. but all you do is you have your calendar that says lie down mm. um, and so you lie down for 10 minutes and you listen to a guided mm. lie down while you're doing it but put your phone down once yes. you set it going put your phone down and then and you only have to do it for 10 you can only do it so if you start by doing it for a minute or 5 minutes and then get longer the point it take me five minutes to get down on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And I and I have to say I'm still not very good at doing it, you know, especially in the winter when the floor's cold. Yeah. You know, you've got to find yourself uh, a rug, something firm, some books under your head, you know, and then put a big blanket over yourself. It's just to be warm, just to encourage you to do it. Um I don't do it, but what I do do is take time. So the point of it is to stop for a small amount of time in your day because if you never stop and never think about yourself in your day then you'll just carry on doing the same habitual movements that got you into backache or anxiety or whatever elbow knee pain whatever you've got and if you want to stop those things happening you have to stop doing what you habitually do and you it's not like you can learn new moves to make yourself better. It's not like do this exercise and you'll be better because you'll still be doing the old thing plus the new thing. Um, and then it just, you know, it just won't work. So first of all, you have to stop. And that's what this lying down thing is all about, is stopping. So for instance, if you're in a anxiety spiral, the first thing to do is to stop the anxiety spiral and find a way to stop it. That's easier said than done, but you do, well, you can, as you say, there are techniques that you can use and we're not going to we're no, not that's, you're not talking about that's that at all. That's different territory, but it is the first The first thing in the Alexander technique is always stop. Yeah. Stop, be present. You know, can you see? Look around you, listen Listen to what's going on. Again, this is what meditation does. You know, just mm. listen, listen to what's going on. You know, it's a kind of physical and mental meditation. That's, that's the difference. Meditation is more or less purely mental or spiritual or whatever you want to say, but 
but this is a physical this is being present in yourself because yeah, there's often, no woo in that is there you know no. it's, it's literally you're, no. you're just what is my body doing right now it's training your yeah training your mind to pay attention to your body yeah uh, because after all, the body is the vehicle which experiences life. You know, you see things, you feel things, you taste things, you know, and without those senses, you can't experience anything. Um, so those are the things that guide us. And then those are the things that also trigger us in, in trauma. You know, if you, um, I don't know, p- people have violent reactions to smells. Oh my God, that smells like that thing did 25 years ago when I was trapped in that room and blah, 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 blah. And they have this whole connection just like how people hold on to old injuries. Oh, well, once I broke my ankle when I was eight. The number of times I hear this in a lesson, I say, okay, any any physical problems? No, no, I'm perfectly fine. And then we work for a bit, and then after a while they say, well, there was that time when, you know, I had total kidney failure when I was 12 and I spent a week in the hospital. You know, and that was decades ago. And they still, it still informed something of their, of their yeah. use. Um, no matter how small they think it is, sometimes it only takes the smallest thing to to derail you. I mean, yeah, I, I, I smashed up in, in different times. I smashed up basically the whole of my right hand side, not all at once, no. you know, just just in small pieces, <laughs> and then they got better, and then another bit broke. And I've I've worked my way from head to toe on that one. Mm. But that's always going to have some kind of cumulative effect yes. on how I use my body. Yes. You know, in terms of, I mean, I have limited use um, or lim- limited range of movement in parts, certain elements of my right-hand side. Yeah. And because of that, I I adapt the yes. way that I move. And it's not necessarily the right way to adapt. You know, and I, I'm trying to get, I'm working through that. Yes. You know, letting go, being able to actually let go of the muscles that are constantly being clenched. Yes. And they're not clenched because of the injury. It's got nothing to do with the injury. It's me protecting it. Yes. You know, the, the fact that, for instance, my ankle has got a limited range of movement has got nothing to do with my muscles holding onto it. It's because my ankle is set in a certain way. Yes. There's not a lot I can do about that. Yes. But holding on to stuff in my upper leg and in my lower back yes. is because of that. And I'm, you know, you know how long it's taken me to try and break that down. Yes. Which which refers back to post traumatic stress disorder it's a thing where you know you you broke your ankle once so you know it's something that could happen could happen again so going back to a a different kind of traumatic experience if if uh, if someone did something horrible to you once you think well that could happen again then you start recognizing that pattern in other other people that try and hurt you You think well that happened there it's happened the same way here then you then you just it becomes a new habit so then you're always on your guard so you're always on your guard about, oh, could possibly do that again. You know, if someone's got Jessica a... is making trombone motions for those who are listening. She's now making accordion motions. I don't know why I'm making these motions in my habitual talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a um, musician, you see, it's habitual. Yeah. Um, so you've you derailed me. I just derailed you there, you didn't did, I? You did, yeah, yeah. Should we stop and find out where you were? No, it's, it's funny. But it, it is, it identifies you. So, for instance, I'm a musician, you're a musician. And uh, even if you're not in a period of currently playing live, which, you know, I'm, t- I'm taking a break, I'm taking a break from music to focus on this stuff. I still can't play live. I'll tell you what, though, if this hand grows, if the nails on this hand grow too long, I feel really, really weird. Mm, I, yeah, I, I hate it. So I haven't played guitar since probably our last gig in October, or, or no, would have been the Christmas live stream. Um... And I have to keep this hand short and this hand longer. If it's any different, it feels very strange. Yeah. Um, I find that with my right hand. Well, both hands really, but my right hand, my fingernails. Yeah. I, I feel they have to be short and it feels really odd if they're even slightly long. Yeah, because it's something that identifies you, isn't it? I just can't stand the sound of um, nails on my nails on bass strings I can't stand that sound no no other people would do it and it, it's, a, it's a great part of their sound but I, I can't stand it it's against the, round, the rounds isn't it the wine yeah. rounds yeah so it, all these things identify us and it's really surprising I think the point I want to make is that you won't know you won't know the weird things that you do and the point um, well it's one of the it's one of the main tenets of the Alexander Technique, if you like. We call it faulty sensory perception. 
the point is you can't possibly know th- the things that you're doing because to you they will feel normal so if you habitually um say you're a military you have a military bearing because you you know once my colleague once served in the wrens for instance it was only for a smallish period of time but it was during her formative years so she's maintained that military bearing which means that she's got um, a habit where she you know leans backwards so for her to let go that felt normal so then over the training for her to let go of that and slowly if you imagine duke here letting go of his back so that it comes upright he's going to start feeling like he's leaning forwards forward, yeah. so for him it's going to feel very strange until the rest of him adjusts to maintain this new balance which is actually your teacher will tell you this is much better a better way of using yourself is going to feel weird so that's what we call faulty sensory mm. perception it's your proprioceptive sense your sixth sense if you like you know you've got smell sight taste sound I keep forgetting. <laughs> so you've got your five senses. Huh? Hearing. Hearing, smell, sound. Oh, he's just sounding. Yes, anyway, right. you know what I mean. The sixth one is your kinesthetic sense. It's your sense of space that you take up, and it, in, and it informs things like the way if you lean to one side or lean to the other side. So people with Parkinson's, for instance, will habitually might habitually lean to one side, and they won't know because it feels normal. Um, so a teacher one-to-one, and this is important because everybody is different, will help you to figure out what you're doing wrong. If you have a habitual lean to one side and it won't even be noticeable to anybody, but your teacher will help you figure it out. If you habitually lean to one side, it could cause a twist in the spine, then you just wonder why your right hip really hurts more than your left hip. It's because you're doing something you can possibly uh, figure out. So that's why it unravels and it takes time if you think if you're you know 50 years old you've been doing that stuff for 50 years you can't expect it to all go away in a lesson or two lessons no that's right it will take a long time and and it's up to you how far you want to get if you just relieve the pressure enough so your your hip stops hurting well that's fine but then there'll be a whole lot more and we'd call it like peeling the layers off the the onion you know you just think okay i've got rid of all those crappy habits Oh, here's something else I didn't know I did. Oh, here's something else. I did. And before you know it, you've kind of decluttered all these habits and you're a completely different person, if, if you want to, if you're willing to change, if you're willing to let all those old habits go, which is a really scary process. Are you aware of letting go any weird habits over the course of Alexander lessons that you've had? I don't, don't know about that, but I know that... Um when I first stood up out of the chair, I said to Tim, um, this doesn't feel right. You know, I feel completely out of balance. I don't feel like I'm standing up straight. I feel like I'm bent over and everything. He said, no, you're completely straight. <laughs> he said, this is perfect. Right. And, and he said, but why don't you feel right? And he said, adjust to the way that you were. And it was moving my, I had to move my pelvis back and to the right. And it was the bass player's stance, <laughs> leaning on my right leg. Right. And, and, but that was, and that was my, the way that I walked. Yeah. And the way that I stood was leaning back on the right hip. Yeah. That was, so, and that's, Tim helped me as well in walking because the way that my ankle was set, my, my foot points at 20 degrees. Yeah. So I have to kind of bring that, but he helped me bring my foot round. And yes. And then it's, it's about yeah. recovering from that. Yes. So, yeah, that, that's, um, that's a biggie for me. I remembered where I interrupted you. We were talking about trauma and you were saying about how um, people make that connection between someone coming in and saying, hello, how are you, to robbing them blind you know, or something. <laughs> yes. and so everybody who says, hello, how are you, was going to rob them blind. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And it's, uh, it's ridiculous when you think about it. Well, that's you can't possibly live that way but some people do yeah. and it's all very varying extents of that too it's but not that... to us as and we are lay people yes. that feels intuitively as if that is the same thing as having that stance because you've always stood like that you're going to keep on doing that yes because you've you know oh I, I hurt my arm I hurt my collarbone which I did kids um, so I'm going to stand you know I, I can't for the benefit of the listeners, I'm kind of dropping my right shoulder and moving backwards. Yeah, you're going to keep it at arm's way, aren't I you? I don't know that I did that. Yes, I mean, yes. But 
but it, it, intuitively we think that it's um, trauma and perhaps PTSD. I mean, we, we don't want to say it's a simple thing, but it is partly, mm. it seems quite intuitive, a similar thing that you're holding on to something and you're, you're behaving in a way yes. because that's what you think is normal. Yes. That's how your body feels because of the um, stress hormones and everything yes. else. That's the way it is. Obviously, if, um, if any PTSD experts would like to come on and tell us how this is working, that would be fantastic and we'll oh, put you on the show. Yeah. Um, we really would love to hear that. Yeah, I looked up the PTSD organisation website yesterday and they said there are two main treatment options, one of which was uh, cognitive behaviour, beha- behavioural therapy and the other one was, I can't remember, something to do with the eyes and programming. Um, but they say, you know, the main thing is, is some kind of talking therapy and I thought, well, it's to me, having known a couple of people with PTSD, diagnosed and undiagnosed, what's clearly PTSD, is that the trauma is definitely held in their bodies, and you can tell because of the you know the defensive um, stance they take. That that reflex is to bundle yourself inwards, to narrow and protect your front, like a kind of almost fetal going into a fetal position. And that startle pattern, which is hands out, flexed, head back, and then the second part is the is the closing in. If you're living in that, you can just you can just imagine that it's squashing all your organs down the front, um, and shortening your legs and pulling your head down and all that. And it's a defensive, like a like a boxer blocking themselves. And if you're living with that every day, even though no one's out to get you anymore, that's definitely going to affect your your musculoskeletal system. You know, that's how you get people who are stooped over. And, um, and squished over and your organs need room to move you know if your if your liver or your stomach or your intestines or anything or your lungs aren't if they don't have all the room they need to to work then their functioning is going to be impaired so you have this cycle your use which is the way you use yourself and move and think and, and act affects the functioning of your organism and the functioning affects the use and the use affects the functioning until you end up you know, spiralling into into sickness. Now, at this point, there's a very big disclaimer. I'm not saying that all sickness is caused by bad use. Right. Obviously, that's a very dangerous path to and go. And you're also saying, you're not saying that Alexander Technique can cure sickness. By the same you're token, not, exactly. That. That's no. What I'm saying is that if you have things wrong with you, your first port of call should still be the doctor. Yes. However, if you have gone to the doctor and you've had umpteen tests and no one can figure out what's wrong with you, then at that point you might like to try AT because the chances are that these patterns of use and stress um, can be worked through in a course of Alexander lessons. And there have been some clinical studies which have proven that Alexander lessons um, have had very positive effects in cases of back pain. Um, and there's another one for neck pain and there's another one for Parkinson's people with Parkinson's disease which is really encouraging It's also something about tinnitus as well isn't there there, there there's a link there, yeah. or there's something that Alexander can, can there are uh, again the rest of it is backed up by so many documented cases books Alexander's own books other people's books that um, someone comes for say something like uh, back pain I think Alexander treated someone or one of his assistants treated someone she came with back pain uh, sorted out the back pain and then she said oh by the way that ringing that I had permanently in my ears is gone and she never mentioned the ringing in her ears some cases of tinnitus I did read a paper where some cases of tinnitus can be can be alleviated Mm -hmm. because it's again it's about um, your attention it's where your attention is guided so even if you think you have a ringing in your ears permanently, sometimes it doesn't ring because your attention is diverted. So, because that, that's another one, isn't it, tinnitus? That um, I don't think we, we particularly know very much about it. Once again, if there are any tinnitus experts listening, mm. we'd love to have you on the show. Definitely. You know, that that would be a great conversation. Definitely. The woman who said to Alexander that the ringing had stopped in her ear said she just moved from next door to a church or something. Because <laughs> that might explain. The bells have stopped. <laughs> Well, as I was just explaining in my online lesson before we started this chat, um, 
inside your head, so you see inside don't Duke touch, here. Duke here is our microphone stand of the day. Um, if I had a skull, I could show you. But where the where the well, you have got a skull. It's on your head. I've got my own skull. Okay, so my own skull, where the head meets the top of the spine, is in between here. For the benefit of the listeners. Okay, so I've got my fingers behind my jaw and under my ears, and there's a little hollow there. Uh, in front of what is called the mastoid process. So it's the bony bit of the skull and the jaw, which is hinged from the skull and under the ears. If you follow your fingers inwards from there, you'll meet the top of your spine, which is where your head balances. And around that, of course, you've got your ear canals, your soft palate, uh, and all the nervous center of your brain. So there's no, there's no nerves there because it would be unbearable. But um, that's where all the kind of communications, that's like your, your basic broadband hub, is sat there. <laughs> so it stands to reason that in some cases of tinnitus, which are caused by stress and all those squishy bits stressing out, for instance, you know, you've got this kind of stretchy fascia around your brain, which is what shrinks when you're dehydrated and gives you a hangover. <laughs> I haven't got a hangover. No stranger to that. Um, stands to reason that if you can put some more space in around those areas of hundreds of bones that make up the skull alone um, that it could well work and if you if you put it together with you know a certain person who's been diagnosed with tinnitus and some hearing loss who is a guitarist who is going to have some kind of um, you know musculoskeletal bias to one side because of the way they play stands to reason there could be some stress there that they're not aware of and that would be well worth investigating i mean there's very few some some people there are in the world who have natural very good use there are some people who have what they what looks like terrible use but don't have any pain or anything like that um there are other people who look like they have good use and have lots of pain so it's not something you can just diagnose even though we like to say oh look at that person they could do with some adjusting <laughs> It's so it's so individual what causes us to twist, turn, stress, squish, um, that it's really something that needs to be worked through over time. And I think just people owe it to themselves to give themselves that time to work through. Mm. Otherwise, what are you going to do? You're just going to ignore it until it goes away and it won't. <laughs> well, ultimately it will. Well, ultimately, yeah, you just leave in a box, you know, yeah. what's the point of that? Um, so... I think we've covered most things burbling away. Very good. Very good. Back to the studio. Back to the studio. Back to the studio. I've talked for me, that's what it shows with. Yeah, we're not putting that in the show, that's not going to be. <clears throat> well, I'd like to thank you, Chris, for uh, talking to me about the Alexander Technique, which is much, much more interesting and enjoyable for me talking to someone else than trying to explain to the camera what it's all about it's very hard isn't it <laughs> we'll talk about that at some point as well so um, so yeah the upshot is wouldn't you recommend just have a go I'll oh, give it a go definitely give yes go. Yeah. Um, you know I'm offering a free half hour online consultation I don't know you can't argue with it really we, not really no not really <laughs> other Alexander Technique teachers are available of course they are but there's teachers all around the world all around the globe as flat earthers would say. <laughs> you can look them up on alexandertechnique.co.uk in the UK and there's uh, others uh, around the world. I'm sure you can just Google them. So you can, if you want to go and see someone in person, which is always to be recommended, then you can do that. Find one nearby. But if you particularly want to see me... And why um, wouldn't you? And why wouldn't you? Uh, then um, you're quite welcome to join me online and we can arrange online lessons as well. So... Either way, just uh, just look into it, because if you've tried everything else, then you've got nothing to lose. <laughs> so, thank you for watching uh, the Space Out Space Bar Radio Show with me, Jessica Lee Morgan, and Christian Thomas, and also Duke Skellington. Back to the studio.